That was for the pastor to wake up. That's what that uh, alarm was. Wake up the pastor. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We're picking up where Paul left off. He left off in chapter, or past, uh, 1 Corinthians. And so as we approach this second letter, there's been some time that's taken place. Um, forgive me for not getting that time for you. But Paul had some questions that came to him. And he's going to address them here in this first part of the, the letter here, um, where they were um, kind of thinking that he really had his own authority put on himself, that man had given him this authority. So Paul wants them to understand it wasn't by man that gave him this authority to be an apostle, but it was by the will of God. And so as Paul uh, approaches this letter and gives them some great understanding, this whole letter is going to give them some doctrine. And doctrine is theology. It's getting the, the sound teaching of how we should live in the light of what God has given us in His Word. So we need to understand that as our Christians living today, how to live. How to live right. How to live the way God would want us to live so that we please Him and that we would reflect Christ in our lives. The title of tonight's message is Trials and Testimony. And the question I have is, what does your life reflect? Does it reflect how you handle it? And it should reflect how you handle it. In fact, it does reflect how you handle it. And hopefully, it's reflecting Christ in how you handle every trial you go through. But we need to also understand as we go through trials, there's a purpose in those trials. And you've heard me teach you this many times. The purpose in a trial is to grow you and to mature you. But there's something else. And we're going to read that here in a moment, so I'm not going to give you a spoiler. We'll just wait until we get there so that you can read it with me so when we think about what god wants to give this corinthian church and i think as us as well is one is to give them doctrine correction clarification and encouragement how many of you need some encouragement how about some good news well just know this we look at the world around us we look at the craziness that's happening the wickedness that seems to be becoming more and more rampant don't forget this god's in charge he's still on the throne don't fear, don't fret, don't get all distressed. We're going to have a teaching on Sunday morning, so make sure you're here. Um, we're going to go through Matthew 24 to talk about the signs of the times and help us understand what's taking place in our world today. Seeing these uh, earthquakes that are taking place, it's horrific. But I want to ask the question, is it judgment? Or is it just because our earth is sin, uh, was cursed by sin? We don't know. Well, we'll read the Word and see what God tells us. So here we have in this chapter, um, Paul is reminding them of him and Timothy's witness, how he lived out his life before them. And I think we can glean from that. They lived a tremendous testimony before all the believers and unbelievers alike of how to live godly. And you think about it, how to live godly around other believers. I mean, it's easy to be godly around other believers. You're, it, it's just, you come to church, it's, it's good. It's, you're, it's, we're rubbing off on each other. But to be around those who want to kill you, to be around those who want to stone you or, or uh, take you and put you in prison, Paul still lived a godly life. He still reflected Christ. In fact, people were getting saved because of Paul having his prison ministry, so to speak. So let's pick it up here in verse 1 of Second Corinthians chapter 1. It says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints who are all in all Acacia, who are, who are in all Acacia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I am an apostle by the will of God. No man gave it to him. It was by the will of God. So he says, this is whom the letter is from. Paul, your brother in Christ, an apostle by the will of God. He's an apostle of whom? Jesus Christ. What is an apostle? It's one who is, is sent with a message. Now the office of apostle, and we'll call that office of apostle with a capital A, is done. There's no more new... The, the apostles were the foundations of the church. They were establishing doctrine for the church. So that's already been established. We don't need capital A apostles anymore. Many call themselves apostles. I'm apostle so-and-so. Well, that's just pride in their own hearts because know this. We're all messengers. We're all sent with a message. Go into all the world and, and do what? Preach the good news. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news of Christ. So we're all, in that sense, apostles. So anybody who wants to put that in front of their name, I feel it's the same as someone who calls himself Reverend so-and-so. That's just, to me, it's, like, it's just wrong. 
The only one that should be revered is the Lord God Almighty. And that's it. That's a good spot for an amen. Are you guys awake? All right, just checking. All right, all right. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and he's got Timothy, our brother, with him. This letter is to the church of God at Corinth and to all the saints who are in Caesarea. He says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Note this, you will never have peace with God until you experience His grace. Grace comes first. It's, it's, we are saved through faith. We're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians tells us. We have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you can't even have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but by the grace of God. And g- grace is getting unmerited favor. You get blessed by God. You didn't earn it. You, didn't, you don't receive it because you did something to earn it or merit it. It's unmerited favor. And the point is this. It's favor. That's grace. Now we hear grace and mercy all the time. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. That's a great spot for me. Amen. Because we all want God's mercy. And the cool part about this, the Bible says that God's mercy is new every morning. Aren't you glad? Because every morning we need some mercy in our lives because we're knuckleheads. Well, I'm a knucklehead. Maybe you're not, but I'm a knucklehead. And I could use God's mercy and grace each and every day. But he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So you get God's grace. Now you have right standing with the Lord. That's how you get peace. So it's the peace. uh, We're now at peace with God. In fact, you can't have peace in your life until you get right with God. Because when you're at peace with God, now you can have the peace of God in your life. And it's the peace of God is amazing. It's it's unfathomable if you think about it. Think about Look in the mirror and say, how could God save me? You know, look in the mirror and say, how could God redeem me? Well, it's by grace and grace alone. Verse 2, or excuse me, verse 3. Here we have the greeting. Now we have some comfort that's coming. You need some comfort. Well, there's many out there that are suffering and they need some tremendous comfort. And that's where you come in. Check this out. Blessed be the God and Father of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. So you go through a trial. And yes, you grow mature and God has an intended purpose for that so that you can trust Him more and more in your life. And as we trust Him more and more in our life, our lives reflect Christ more and more. Why? Because we're trusting God. We're not fearing, we're not fretting, we're pursuing Him, wanting more of Him. And that faith grows and matures and we become stronger Christians, mature Christians. And then on top of that, as we go through trials, we grieve, we struggle with trials. We're grieving. And guess what? It's the Lord who comforts you. And then he uses that for you to comfort others who go through trials as well. Barnabas was a great example. He was an encourager. People go through trials and and he's there to encourage them, to comfort them. You know, hey, I know what you're going through. I've been through it and those kind of things. But there's no greater one to be our champion than Jesus Christ because he knows everything that you've gone through or are going to go through as far as pain and suffering. He suffered it all. He emotionally suffered. He physically suffered. And think about it. His greatest suffering, I think, is when he was separated from the Father. He cried out, God, why have you forsaken me? Father, what's going on here? As he hung on that cross and he took upon himself sin, our sin, your sin, my sin. He says, best be God of our Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble. With comfort, with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, Paul and Timothy is referring to, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. He's like, we, when we go through cri- trials and then get comforted by the Lord, it's that very comfort that we experience that we can give to others. God gives and we give. God gives us what we need to get through a trial. Therefore, we can comfort others in that same type. And I, you know how to comfort somebody the best way? is reflect Christ, have compassion, empathy, and, and sympathy. And, and, and on top of all of that, you point them to the Lord, who's, got, who, who's able to endure all of what they're going through, he, who has endured all of what they're going through. And here he is, the one that comforts us, so he wants us to comfort one another. Verse 6 says, Now if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And remember, Paul's speaking to these Corinthian believers. He says, if we're afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. 
Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope is for you is steadfast. Because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you partake of the consolation. Paul's like, what we went through was for your consolation. How so? And salvation? How so? Because of what we went through and the ministry that God has provided for us to be a part of, you got saved. You are going through trials. We're going to comfort you. Others are going to comfort you. So the Lord is using them in a tremendous way. And he says, our hope for you is steadfast. Paul had a tremendous heart for this group of people. The knuckleheads. Remember, these Corinthians are knuckleheads. They had every gift, but they were just all selfish, carnal Christians. He says, you're babes in Christ. And he wasn't complimenting them. Oh, you sweet little thing. No, you're a baby. You should, you should be eating meat, but you're just sucking on the bottle in Christ. But now he's, he's wanting them to grow. He's wanting them to mature, so he's helping them along. He says, you're struggling. You're going through things. But the Lord comfort us as we went through things. He'll comfort you. We comfort you, and you'll co- comfort others as well. Verse 7, he says, Our hope is steadfast for you because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, you will also partake of the consolation. It's kind of like pay it forward. As, as Paul and them went through trials, I mean, facing death, especially Paul, faced what he faced and the struggles and the trials that he went through, he went through for the sake of believers. He went through for these Corinthians to get to them, to minister to them, to help them understand the goodness of God, to teach them doctrine, to help them understand how to live right for God, how to correct their misconceptions and their actions as they were not doing things as, they, as appropriate as they should in the church. And as he did that, he shown his love to them. I love you enough to tell you you're wrong. I love you enough to tell you how to do it right. And here he's even given them more instructions in this second letter. But he's starting it without is that he loves them in that sense where he's giving them an understanding that they're going through trials. He went through trials, so he wants to comfort them and for them to comfort others. Just as God used him, he wants God to use them as well. Now, verse 8. He says, for we don't want you to be ignorant. This is Paul's famous saying. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. Now, it's not the, the ignorant is just lack of knowledge. We use it at times in a negative way, but ignorant isn't a, a, a him like, come on, you're a bunch of stupid people. He's saying you're just ignorant. I don't want you to be ignorant. I want you to understand. I want to teach you this. And he says, we don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raised the dead. Do you see what happened? They were facing death, and he says it was so that they wouldn't trust in themselves, but they would trust in the Lord. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of our troubles because we were burdened beyond measure. We want you to know what we went through and why we went through, and that's going to help him comfort them as well. He said, and it's part of that testimony he's about to talk about. He says, we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raised the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that He will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. Paul's like, the Lord used you guys even in your prayers. The Lord delivered us from death. He's encouraging them that God delivered us through all of our sufferings. And what a great way to think about it. Here he's encouraging them that they're going through their, with all their trials and their struggles and all of that. He's saying, hey, God delivered us. We want to use what God delivered us in so that you can understand. And he'll deliver you as well when you face trials and hardship. And the New, put it, the New Living uh, Translation puts these uh, 8 through 11 like this. It says, we were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. We thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely on God who raises the dead. Remember, Paul said, you know, I I, I struggle with to remain or to go. He's at the end of his life and he's like, you know, I want to I want to go home. But is it beneficial for me to stay? You know, and he had this struggle. Lord, I, I'm ready to go home. But Lord, it's also beneficial to be here to, to, uh, to be a part of the lives of these believers. He had a struggle there. That's some great love. I'm like, I'm out of here, God. Take me home. I've, I've, I've paid my price. I paid my dues. I'm done. I'm ready to go home. Let the other guy come in and take over. Paul was like, no, I love you enough that, hey, I think it's more beneficial to stay on and stay working and ministering to you. He also knew God has a perfect timing. And if it was his time to go, he'd go and God would raise up another. 
But he goes on and says, it goes on and says here in verse 10, um, it, verse 9, he said, it, it was God, we learned to rely on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. See, what he's developing here is this attitude of we trust him, even in, in, in our lives. We trust him. We trust him that, hey, if, if mortal danger is coming our way, and knowing that, hey, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord, there is nothing to fear, but knowing they're not dying until it's their time. So, hey, God's delivered us, and we, we know he'll keep on delivering us. And I'll put in parentheses, until the time is time for them to go. Because it's appointed for man once to die and then judgment. Thank God for the Christian, for those who are followers of Christ, the judgment has already been paid. We'll stand before the God, before the Lord, and guess what? We get rewards for the things that we did right. We'll get what we deserve. And that'll be a good time. We'll get what we deserve. We'll get the rewards for the attitudes and the, and, and the, the actions that we did that were all to bless the Lord and bless others. Anything that we do for um, uh, pride's sake or selfish sake, well, no rewards for that. But no judgments casting down on you. Because Jesus Christ took the judgment of all faith, of all uh, followers of Christ. He says, We have placed our confidence in Him and He will continue to rescue us. Verse 11. And uh, you are helping us by praying for us. And then many people will give thanks because God has graciously answered so many prayers for our safety. What an attitude. Paul's just saying, the trials led them to trusting the Lord instead of man. And folks, may we too put our trust in the Lord and never in man. <laughs> man will always fail you. Your husband will fail you. Your wife will fail you. Your friends will fail you. Your kids will fail you. You'll fail them. Why? Because we're imperfect. We're human. But we serve a God who is perfect and will never fail us. Christ will never fail us. God will never fail us. He always comes through and He has our best interest in mind. That's a great spot for an amen. God has your best interest in mind. Yet sometimes that's difficult to go through a trial. It's like a child getting a discipline. Th my dad used to say, this is going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And I'm like, yeah, right. Because that belt hurt. But guess what? In the long run, it was beneficial. And God disciplines us when we get off track. He brings us back. Gets us to, to surrender even more. It's like, you, you want that? Go for it. But you're going to pay the consequences. You want to play with that hot stove? Go ahead. You're going to get burned. You want to play with that cactus? Go for it. Go to here. Play catch. No, he says, go for it. But he's there to comfort us in time of need. Verse 12. And Paul goes on and says, For our boasting is this. Paul liked to brag, but it was never about himself. He says, this the, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and more, more abundantly towards you. He's boasting about how he lived a godly life before them. But it's not about him, it's about the reflection of Christ in him. He goes on in for verse 13, he says, For we are not writing any other things to you, or what you read or understand. Now I trust you will understand even to the end, as also have you have understand, understood as in part. That we are, we are your boast as you are also ours in the day of Lord Jesus. He's like, our letters have been straightforward. There's no in-between things. There's no vague things we're telling you. We're, gonna, we're not going to tell you yes and then no. It's, hey, here's the important thing. What we told you is truth. He says, even, even, even if you don't understand now, hopefully when the Lord returns, you'll be not only understanding, but you'll be proud of us as well as we're proud of you. Can we say that of ourselves, that our testimony is of God? Our testimony is of Godly living and an example for all believers and unbelievers to see. And when we have a testimony, as Paul and Timothy did, that reflects Christ, God gets the glory. And people see that's what God does to a life. That's the testimony. Where I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was in darkness, now I'm light. I once act like a fool, and now I'm a saved, living for God. Still act stupid sometimes, but that's human nature. But we give God glory and our lives reflect Christ. The more and more it does, the more we trust Him, the more we rely on Him, our lives become this great reflection. It's like the sun that reflects off of the moon. We see the reflection. We don't see the sun when we look at the moon. We're seeing the reflection. And I like to put it this way. People in our lives need to see the reflection of the sun. S-O-N. That they would see God in us, Christ in us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. 
If they see Jesus Christ's change does, that gives God glory. You don't get the glory. God gets the glory. If you take the glory well, get ready because you're going to fall flat on your face. But God gets the glory when we trust God with everything and we live that example out before others. But Paul goes on and says, and this confidence, what confidence? That our testimony is true. It was true before you. He says, and this is in, the, in this confidence, I intended to come to you before, that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Remember in, in chapter 16, he had talked about, I'm going to go and, and I have some plans. I'd like to even come in winter with you. I don't want to just come on a weekend. I want to come and spend some time with you. But some things had to change, had changed. God had a different plan. He says, I intended to come to, to come to you and bless you and the Lord again. He says in verse 17, therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Here he asks some rhetorical questions. Did I do it lightly? And the Greek way of asking this is in, in giving the inference of no, I didn't do it lightly. It's a negative answer. No, I didn't do it lightly. I poured out and making my plans. But he says, he says, did I, when planning this, did I do it lightly? When I was planning to come see you, did I do it lightly? No. Or the things that I plan, do I plan according to the flesh? <clears throat> no. That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful and our word to you was not yes and no. It wasn't this mixed up big stuff. It was specific and to the point. And yes, if he said he was coming by the, by the will of the Lord, he would come. But he, remember what he had told them. If it's the Lord's will. He had made the plans or intended, had them, intended to make some plans. But if it's the Lord's will, he had wrapped up that first letter to them. And so now he's saying, did we give you a yes and a no? He says in verse 19, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Salvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. So Paul is just telling them, hey, we've been telling you the truth. We were faithful to the word, and we had given you a yes and a no, but it was never a yes and no on the, on the same question. It wasn't like, hmm, maybe. He's saying that we were truthful. We were faithful to what we had told you. And he asked them the questions, and they were all rhetorical. Did we do it lightly? No. We planned, we planned very specific. But again, back here, as he had said in verse, uh, uh, chapter 16 of the first letter, was that, hey, if it's the Lord's will, we'll come to you. He says, just as the Lord is his true to his word, just as his promises are yes, so too was the way we lived before you. He says, we preach to you the word of truth, the word of God. Just in Christ, all his promises are yes and amen, faithful and true, so too are ours. And I think that's something we can glean from, that let your yes be yes and your no be no, as James tells us. That we don't have this uh, wishy-washy maybe, but we, yeah, I want to be there I'm, if the Lord wills. Or no, I'm not going to be there because of this. But we, we stick to our word. We're, we're men and women of, the, of word. We keep our word. Because our word should be something that we really take pride in. A good pride that, hey, I'm gonna, if I tell you I'm going to be there, then I'm going to be faithful to be there. Why? Because that's a reflection of who I am. And who I am is in Christ. And if I'm not keeping my word, then what does that look like to those who are expecting something out of me and yet I don't come through when I say I'm going to come through? Pfft, who wants to deal with a Christian like that? What kind of testimony is that? Oh, he never keeps his word. He says this, but he never does that. So we need to make sure that our lives truly do reflect the Lord in what we say we're going to do and follow through with it. Paul says, you can trust what we preach to you. You can trust uh, our integrity. You saw our integrity and our faithfulness. Not only to you, but to the Lord as well. And now verse 21, he says, He who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God. So lo the Lord gave them the fellowship together. He established them together in God, in Christ. He says, it was the Lord that did this. We didn't come to you and win you over because we're great people. He says... It's he who establishes us with you in, in Christ and has anointed us is God. And folks, that's how he does with us. He, he anoints us as his children. He gifts us as his children. As, and we use those gifts to fellowship with one another, to um, partake of the Lord in, in, in fellowship. And in, uh, as we meet in, uh, with each other in church, we bless each other. We get, the gifts we're given are for each other. And the Lord uses that. Um, but it's the Lord who does it. It's not us. 
Verse 22, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. As a guarantee of what? Good question, huh? Guarantee of His return. That you're His. You've been adopted. And this is one of those verses where you read this and you're thinking, man, I have the seal of God in my life then I can't not be unsealed. Well, wait till we get to Sunday. If you endure to the end. That seems to be a common theme throughout the Bible when it comes to walking with the Lord and not having to face judgment. If you, in, if you endure to the end, then the judgment's already been paid for you. And again, it goes back to, am I saved? Was I saved? Can I lose it? Can I? The bottom line is, if you're walked away from God, you're not living like you're saved, and you should be living like you're saved, and so make a change, repent. But here he says, it's God who does the establishing. It's God who's anointed us. It's God who sealed us and given us a spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Remember, the Bible says that we are not our own. That our Bibles, have, our Bibles, our bodies have been bought with a price. Our Bibles have bought with a price too. Um, and they get worse and worse in price. But it's the Lord who sealed us. He says, now you're mine. The Bible tells us that we've been adopted into the family. That's pretty amazing. Now you can be called a child of God. But he goes on in verse four, uh, 23. Moreover, I call God as witness against my soul that to spare you, I came no more to Corinth. <laughs> Why? Why didn't he go back? To spare him from what? Another spanking. Some more rebuke. The Lord's like, hey, I wanted to come back. I wanted to come hang out with you. But the Lord had a different plan because, hey, it was to spare them that he didn't come back to them to bring him a rebuke he goes on in verse 24 he says not that we have dominion over your faith he's like we're not in charge of you we've you know the lord has established us the lord established paul as an apostle with a message he has that authority to hey thus saith the lord almost as the prophet would but here in this establishing of his church he's using the apostles and some of the disciples we see here with timothy and guess what he says we're not in control of your faith we don't have dominion over it i'm not your i'm not your spiritual boss and that's a good for, thing for all pastors to know. Whether you have a little A apostle next to your name. You're not in control. In fact, we're the least among, it's the pyramid upside down. Because we're the, the, the leaders of the church, the, the, the apostles, that we're the least among the body. In the sense that we're there for you. We're, we're to serve you. We're to bless you. We're to minister to you. It's not about you ministering to us. You should come in church and bless me. You go to a church that tells you that, flee. There is callings that we bless one another. But the pastor is a shepherd to care for the sheep. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a, she a shepherd get cared for by the sheep. Bah, bah. They're out there eating grass or uh, uh, where there is no grass, they're trying to find grass. The shepherd has to go out there and, and direct them where to go. So the shepherd is caring about the sheep. The shepherd is loving the sheep, putting his life on the line for the sheep. And here he says, we don't have dominion over your faith, but we're nothing but fellow workers for your joy. It's for by faith that you stand. It's not because of us, but it's by your faith that you stand. He says, we came to see the Lord save and change you. And it was for sure your joy. It's our joy as well. But know this, it's by faith in which you stand. It's by your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in which you stand. And you'll see a common theme throughout the scripture of enduring. To stay the course. To endure no matter what comes our way. That we stay on track. And you remember this. You're going to go through trials. Jesus says that in this world you will have tribulations. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I don't hear that from you. That's not a verse we quote and brag about. Oh, Jesus says we're going to go through it. We're going through the ringer. He says, in this world you will have tribulations. He said, but be a good cheer. He says, in me you will have peace. He says, because I've overcome the world. We're going through it. We're going through life. We're going through struggles. We're going through trials. But he tells us this, that he is the one who's going to comfort us. It's the Lord who comforts us in our trials. And may we remember that in closing. May we remember that it's the Lord who brings about what we need when we find ourselves struggling in need of comfort, in need of encouragement. And therefore, may we comfort others as they need. May the Lord use, comforts us, comfort others. He'll comfort them as well, but comfort others. And the best way to comfort anybody is to point them to Christ. Point them to 
the Holy Spirit. Point them to the Comforter. Second point is, may our lives be a true testimony of the Lord Jesus. We reflect what's inside. We truly do. We reflect what's inside, and hopefully it's the reflection of Christ. Jesus said, what's in the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What's in here comes out. And may we pour into more of Christ in us, so that more of Christ comes out of us, and lives will be changed. And then lastly, may our lives truly be a godly impact to those in our lives. That they will see Christ, the hope of glory. They, think about it. As we start seeing tragedies and trials, and I mean, we, when we see things that are taking place, for instance, what we're seeing in, in uh, Turkey and in Syria, earthquake in uh, R- Russia as well, and a, 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 a volcano exploded in Japan. You know, you start thinking of wars and rumors of wars. We got wars. I, I seen a picture, um, our, uh, Amir Sharfati from Behold Israel, Israel. He put this picture on his uh, telegram post of a, a before and after picture. City, buildings and all that before and then after was just wiped out. And he says, this isn't from an earthquake. This is Ukraine from the bombings of uh, Russia. Wars. Rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilence. We just had a major pestilence of COVID. They've been predicting it to get worse, but I don't hear of it getting worse. But it may. Who knows? But we have to keep one thing in mind, and you'll hear this again on Sunday. When all these things start taking place, you know, people start freaking out. Is this, is this the tribulation period? No, it's a precursor to the tribulation period, which could be 20 years from now, could be 200 years from now. But when Jesus said all these things happen, it's just the start of birth pangs. When we start seeing earthquakes, we start seeing tragedies that the Bible predicts will happen. Whether or not it's those, it should cause us to look up. To look up for our Redeemer is drawing near. To keep our mindset that He could be coming for us at any moment. Because you know this, you're not going through the tribulation period. You're going through tribulation, but you're not going through the great tribulation period. That seven-year period is set aside for those who reject Jesus Christ and, the, and Israel. And God will bring judgment to this world. He's not bringing judgment to His followers. The, the bride is not going to get beat up in the tribulation. We're going to escape the tribulation. That's definitely a good spot for an amen. All right. May our lives truly be godly impact to those around us. And the best way to do that is live like Jesus Christ could come today. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that, Lord, you give us, Lord, not only warnings in your word and encouragement in your word, direction and um, sometimes rebuke, but, Lord, you give us love. You give us a, a drawing to you. You show us your mercy. You show us your grace. But, Lord, you also warn us of, of things to come. You also warn us of trials and tribulations in our own lives. Lord, we live in a fallen world and wickednesses are all about us. Struggles are all about us. Temptation is all about us. All those are, are, are passing away. And you are steadfast. You are faithful and true. And Lord, we know that we can trust in you, we cling to you, and you're always with us. We don't have to worry about what comes our way. We just need to know that you are on the throne. You are the God of all comfort. We praise you, we thank you, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing a song before we go.